Does anybody have a, a great and interesting wedding proposal story that they can tell us in less than 30 seconds? That part of it's very important. Anybody got anybody got an interesting wedding proposal story? Anybody? Kind of. She has one. Kind of. Yes, ma'am. Um, it was a beautiful wedding proposal, but so my sister and I danced competitively growing up, and so she was still dancing at the time. So she had to leave practice early in order to be back in time for the proposal because it was both families going out for dinner. Well, we get home and she had to say, yeah, Melissa almost didn't let me go, but I told her about the proposal. I'm in the room with her. And oh, no. I'm like, oh, be surprised. yeah. So needless to say, I kind of had an inkling going in. <laughs> Did you did you look surprised? Yeah. I okay. Off, but <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Anybody else? Wedding proposal stories. My wedding proposal story uh, is a story of perseverance and determination. And after months and months of begging, I finally said yes. And. Uh, but I was thinking about this, and so I kind of did a little bit of reading. There are a lot of very interesting wedding proposal traditions around the world, and I'll share some of those with you. In Fiji, the groom and his family present a whale's tooth to the bride's family in order to ask for permission for a marriage. That's interesting. In Scotland, um, men need to prove their worth by going through a series of trials during a ceremony. Now, here's the best part. It is the father of the bride... That gets, to, uh, that gets to decide what the obstacles are going to be, what the trials are going to be. And if he can successfully maneuver through those, then he's allowed to be engaged to the, to the daughter. In Kenya, men send their prospective fiancé beads, and if she keeps the beads and wears them, the, the answer is yes, we're engaged. It's almost like passing a little note, you know, circle yes, circle no. Um, uh, here's a great one. In China, couples traditionally dissect a chicken together, and if the liver of the chicken is healthy, then they can set a date for their wedding. If the liver is not healthy, they have to keep going until they have a chicken with a healthy liver. In Germany, there is a log-cutting ceremony. In Rome, they kidnap the bride. In Indonesia, they go with no bathroom for three days. Okay, so now that you have heard these stories... The uh, ancient Hebrew custom that you're about to hear coming from chapter 3 of the book of Ruth won't seem nearly as weird to you now that you've heard all of these other stories. So I don't want you to be distracted by the custom that we're about to hear. Um, the point of this chapter, the point of this story, it really is about something much bigger than a marriage proposal. The point of this story, the point of this entire book is redemption. Um, when I hear the word redeem, I immediately think of like turning in a coupon to get something back, you know, 50% off or buy one, get one free. Or uh, when I was growing up, the, uh, the glass pop bottles would pile up on the back porch. And when they got so big, I would go out and, and I would, you know, take a stack of them, whatever I could carry down to the corner store and, you know, turn them in for a nickel a piece and get a candy bar. Anybody else do that? You guys see? So okay. So I didn't make that up. Um, but that's what I think of when I hear redeem. And generally, whatever you're giving, the empty pop bottle or the piece of paper that says coupon on it, whatever you're giving them is not nearly as valuable as what you're purchasing and what you're going to get back in return. But when we think of the concept of redeem coming from scripture, that's really backwards. Because when we think about Jesus Christ redeeming us, giving himself for us, it is he that is of great value, and yet we can never deserve that. We can never be good enough, and that is what it means to be saved by God's grace. So redeem in the Bible is a legal term. It's associated with ransom, atonement, substitution, and deliverance. It's about salvation. And Jesus Christ redeemed us by giving his life in substitution for our own as a ransom to satisfy God's wrath against our sin. It is a debt that has been paid in full. Now, we've given this definition a couple of weeks ago, but this, uh, this word or this phrase kinsman or guardian redeemer that we often see in the Old Testament, it is a close relative who acted on behalf of another who was in trouble or danger or in need. 
And this guardian redeemer, this kinsman redeemer, they could be called on to avenge a death of a relative that may have been murdered or, or died with some kind of suspicious circumstances. And so they could call on this relative to avenge that death. They may purchase someone out of slavery or servitude. And as we see in this story, they may buy back land that was intended to be an inheritance or even marry a widow in order to provide an heir and to keep that family name going. But once again, this is a very nice love story, this story of Ruth, but it's so much more than that. And so the big idea, if you want to write this in your journal, the big idea of the message today, the experiences of Ruth and Boaz point to God's plan to redeem us. The experiences of Ruth and Boaz point to God's plan to redeem us. So yes, Ruth is a book about history. It is documenting life during a specific period in time. Ruth is a book about a love story. It's filled with romance, and it's romance between people of, of great moral character. But Ruth is also a book about theology, pointing to redemption through Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is our rescuer, our deliverer, our savior. He is our redeemer. Jesus took action while we, while all of mankind, while we were in trouble, while we were in danger, and we were in need. And so number one in your journals, if you're taking notes, we see that Boaz redeemed Ruth. Boaz redeemed Ruth. Now that's coming up in the story. Ruth and Naomi were both widowed. They were both in great need. And so they returned to Naomi's homeland of Bethlehem, Israel. Ruth gleans in the field. That means that she is picking up grain that has fallen to the field. It was hard work, but it was a way to provide some food for herself and for her mother-in-law. She ends up gleaning in a field that's owned by a man named Boaz, who is a relative of Naomi's late husband. He recognizes great character in Ruth because of the way that she is caring for Naomi. And he shows great kindness and generosity to Ruth. And so then, at the end of the chapter that we saw last week, Naomi explains to Ruth that he, that Boaz, is a redeemer of theirs. And that's great news. And so Ruth continued to glean in his field, a place where she would be kept safe until the end of the harvest. And now we pick it up in Ruth chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Now, this is not exactly advice that I ever want to give my daughter, okay? <laughs> but this is an ancient custom, and as weird as it seems to us, it was not weird to them. And it takes place with great modesty and humility. She says, go down to where they're celebrating the recent harvest because the famine is over. Wait until his belly is full. Now that part is great advice. Wait until his belly is full. And then he's going to go lie down to sleep by his grain. And then you sneak in, you uncover his feet, lie down at his feet and wait. We're in verse 6. So she, so Ruth went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Now, I don't know how much time goes by, but at midnight, the man was startled and he turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. <laughs> I thought it was a dream, but he opened his eyes and there's a woman laying at my feet. Again, this is strange to us, but it really wasn't to them. She is showing her interest in marriage to the man that is their family's redeemer. And this redeemer is described in several places in the Old Testament when a family member is in trouble, and it can be for a variety of reasons, but one of those descriptions is in Leviticus 25, verse 48 and 49, that the one that is in trouble, then after he is sold, he may be redeemed. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his cousin may redeem him, or a close relative from his clan may redeem him. 
If he grows rich, he may redeem himself. And Boaz is in this role of redeemer. But even though he's in that role as a close relative, it isn't exactly something that happens every day. And it isn't quite something that he had really considered or something that he expected. Or in verse 9, Boaz said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. So there it is. She has recognized him as redeemer. Her intent now is clear. In verse 10, Boaz said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Now, Ruth was young and capable, and I don't think they ever describe her as beautiful, but I'm going to make that assumption. She's young, she's capable, she's beautiful. She could certainly have looked for a husband and found some young man to be her husband. But he said, this act of kindness is even greater than all of the kindness that you have shown to Ruth before. Because even though you could find a husband and you could move on and you could marry and you would be okay, that would be leaving your mother-in-law in the dust behind. And she has chosen commitment to Naomi above her own interests and above her own future. So Boaz, again, commends her character. And then he promises that they will be taken care of. However, there is a problem. In verse 12, Boaz continues and he said, And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. There is another relative that's even a closer relative to Naomi's dead husband than Boaz. And so he says, remain tonight, stay safe, stay here where it's safe. And then in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So he says, there's another man that's an even closer relative. And he has the right of first refusal, I guess. He has the first right, really the first obligation to be the redeemer. But Boaz promises that he will see this through, not from any selfish motivation, but he is making sure that the matter is addressed and that these ladies are cared for. Verse 14, so she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize one another. It's still kind of dark enough that you can't really see who's who. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment that you are wearing and hold it out. She held it out and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. So he sends her back to Ruth first thing in the morning, but he doesn't send her empty-handed. She has breakfast, and she has good news. Verse 16, and when she came to her mother-in-law, to Naomi, Naomi said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave for me. And he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And she replied, wait, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So that's the end of chapter 3. This chapter ends with Ruth and Naomi showing complete confidence in Boaz. He is a good man. He, he is an honorable man. And he will take care of this matter, and they can trust in him. Next week, we're going to wrap up this story of Ruth. And if you don't know the end of the story, yes, it's pretty much, you know, I, I've spoiled it for you. It's pretty much what you expect. But it's really even better because there are a couple of surprises that make a great story even greater. As Boaz redeems Ruth and Naomi. And all of this pointing to the redemption in Jesus Christ. But before we talk about that, I want to step back and see how God has worked through history before the coming of Jesus. And so number two in your journals, if you're taking notes, Yahweh redeemed Israel. Yahweh redeemed Israel. We learn in the very first verse of Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1 that this story takes place during the same time period as the last study that we went through here on Sunday mornings, the book of Judges, where God was continually delivering and rescuing his people. Well, that is the story of Judges, but that's really the story of all the Bible. 
Jeremiah 20, 13 says, Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. God loves and God cares for his people, even when, and I would say especially when, they, we, deserve it the least. In fact, God knows exactly what you're going through right now. He knows exactly what you need, and he cares deeply. And that is not a promise of health and wealth and eternal happiness here on this earth, but it is a promise of his presence in your life and his eternal joy that is way beyond any physical circumstances of this world and this life. During another time of terrible oppression that comes later in the Old Testament, Israel would be overtaken by the evil nation of Babylon. Many would be killed, but the young and the strong, the best and the brightest, would be carried off and taken as slaves. Daniel is one of those that are taken. You can read his story in the book of Daniel. But he finds himself serving the king of Babylon. And even in this pagan culture where there, everything is hostile against his worship of God, he continued to pray to the one true God. The Bible tells us that three times a day he would, he would pray. Well, jealous men plotted against Daniel, which led to him being thrown into a den of vicious lions. He was being executed for bowing down and praying to God rather than the king. This was entertainment for evil men. This was a warning to other followers of God. But Daniel bravely and boldly stood firm in his faith, not because he knew that he would be rescued in this life, but because he knew that his faith in God reaches beyond this life. So he was thrown into the den, and God miraculously closed the mouths of the lion. The king saw how Daniel's God had rescued, delivered, you could say redeemed him. And then we read the king's words in Daniel chapter 6, verses 26 and 27. He said, I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. Here we see truth, beautiful truth, very clear truth being spoken through the lips of a pagan king because he had seen one man redeemed by the one true God, something that he had never seen before in his pagan worship. Well, that is the story of the Bible. God pursues the people that he loves, and he redeems them over and over again. And much like the story of Ruth and Boaz, it is all pointing toward Jesus Christ. And that's number three in your notes. Christ redeems us. Christ redeems us. You know, you can look around the world, even look around our own towns right here where we live, and there is evil and chaos and violence and war all around us. Everyone is doing whatever seems right in their own eyes. The minds and the hearts of men are far from God. And while we pray for solutions to the conditions of this world, we may be tempted to see and look for temporary or counterfeit or wrong solutions. You see, the world trusts in chariots and horses, the mighty power of armies. The world trusts in silver and gold, the influence that comes from great wealth. But we trust in the Father who has never given up on his people. And in Jesus Christ, whose purpose in leaving heaven and coming here was to rescue us from sin and death and eternal hell. Dave read Mark 10, 45 earlier, the words of Jesus, where he said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a, say it for me, as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, listen to this, Jesus didn't pay the ransom out of his great wealth. He didn't just write a check and say, there it is. Jesus Christ is the ransom, paying the price that we could never pay. He is the ransom, his very life, 
his body broken, his blood shed. That was the cost to redeem us. That is where we place our trust. And we also trust in the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, offering a supernatural peace that is beyond our human comprehension. Paul, right in the center of his letter to Titus, he writes about the grace of God through Jesus, bringing salvation into the world, and then he challenges Titus to teach his church the kind of lives that we are to live. And he writes these words in Titus 2, verses 13 and 14. He says that we are all waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Jesus Christ redeemed us, he purified us, and he did it for a purpose. Jesus paid the price to redeem us, not so he could just set us on a shelf like some trophy, but for a very specific purpose, and Paul just said it to Titus. Jesus rescued us from slavery to sin, to freedom in him, to purify us by washing our sins away and placing his righteousness upon us so that in response to all that he has done for us, that we would burn with the desire to do good works. That's the next step that I want to encourage you to make your prayers this week. You have been redeemed for a reason. So go and do good. Mike, what was the verse that you sent us this morning? Read that for me, one of you guys. We talk all the time about how interesting it is that these guys, their morning devotions just kind of fit right into sermons and into the message. And it's because it's all connected, right? It was all written by the same author with the same theme for the same purpose. You got it, Craig? Ephesians 3, 16, I'll start in verse 14 and go to the 19th context. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And we started to text back and forth about what that means, the fullness of God, to have Christ dwelling in our hearts. And of course, I'm thinking about the application of, of doing good. We're compelled to do good. We're compelled to love each other and to love lost people that are, that are lost and dying outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ because we have experienced the love of God and he lives within us today. One of these guys said, you know, isn't it, isn't it just crazy? Doesn't it just blow your mind that God wants to use a couple of nobodies to be part of his plan? And that is so beautiful because, friends, you were redeemed for a reason. So go and do good. And I don't want you to misunderstand. We're not saved because of good works. You can't be that good. We are saved to do good works in the name of Jesus Christ. So I pray that this week that you'll seek opportunities to do good in the name of Jesus. Maybe you'll make a list. Maybe you'll set some goals. Maybe this will be a conversation with your family around the dinner table. How have you done some good in the name of Jesus today? How can you do good tomorrow in the name of Jesus? But also I want to challenge you to do something very specific. You have an opportunity to do good. By being very generous next week as we give to the West Orange Dream Center. And you're going to be able to go on their website and read more about what they're doing. But I want to tell you what I've seen with my own eyes. Um, we get to partner with them in the good that they are already doing as
us. They provide basic supplies for people that live in that community that, that have great need. As they serve families that have incarcerated parents. As they have parenting classes that are really focused on men, challenging them to be godly men and godly husbands and godly fathers. As they provide Bible studies and prayer and they minister to senior citizens and they have after school programs for kids. They have GED classes. They teach English to those that have a, a different language as their primary language. They mentor others through sports. They have support groups for caregivers. They have men's and women's ministries and so much more. And, and isn't it exciting to be able to come along and to partner with them and all of the good that they're doing? Say amen if that's true. Amen. But I didn't even tell you the most important part. I didn't even tell you the most exciting part. All that they do, they do in the name of Jesus Christ. Very intentionally meeting practical needs while pointing to our Redeemer. It's beautiful, really. So I want to challenge you today to go and do good. But I want you to remember that you're going to have an opportunity next week to be very generous and to do good right here as we partner with them. But if you haven't recognized Jesus as your Redeemer, if you haven't said it out loud like Ruth did in, in our text today, for you are a Redeemer. If you haven't acknowledged Jesus as your Redeemer and you haven't submitted to his authority and to his word, repented of sins, confessed him as Lord, been baptized into his name, if you haven't been raised to live a new life so that you can go about doing good in his name, I want to encourage you to do that today. And I will close with the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 16. He said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our Father in heaven, we come to you today grateful to be in your presence. to be part of your plan, to minister to others, to point others to Jesus, to do good, to show love. Lord, help us to be intentional about these things. And Lord, if we haven't, if anyone here hasn't given their heart to you and submitted to your word, Lord, to your authority, I pray that today is the day. May they either come forward as we stand and sing this next song, or may they grab me or Dave or Craig or, or Mike or one of these other guys after church and just say, man, I just want to talk. I want to pray. I want to know more about this. Lord, let today be the day that they acknowledge Jesus as Redeemer and the, the, the precious, precious price that he paid that we can never deserve. And it's in his blessed name that we pray. Amen.